Thank you. Um, so I have a whole lot to go through today, and I want to kind of shatter a few things in the process, which is always fun. Uh, so I want to start with kind of where we were, right? We, we had a great big thing, and that's what we built, and that's, that's what we relied on for years. And you know, over time, we decided we wanted to change, right? We decided this is a good idea to split things up into different things. You can call them services or microservices or whatever you want to call it, but it was a bunch of things versus one thing. And that was great. It helped us separate our ideas a bit. But we kind of forgot a few things along the way. Um, we kind of, you know, we, we decided we wanted to be connected. And it meant that this choice from calling a function to calling a function that somebody, something else did, it, there was a whole layer of things that sat in between calling that function. Mainly, another connection. Uh, and we did nothing about it. We just put it over there and called it. And, you know, there were some benefits and some drawbacks to that. But in terms of security, we kind of just forgot. Um, so it kind of goes like this. When you want something, you ask a service for some information, and you get it back. That's what happens. There's nothing else. There's no more story to it. How many of us are doing that right now? Uh, there's more, more hands should be going up right now. I know you are. Don't lie. Um, but this is great, but it's, it's, it's lacking so much here, right? When we switch, does, shouldn't that kind of change the way we approach security? Right? Um, I think it should, right? I think that once, when we go from a monolith to a set of services, there's a step that we need to take for security. Um, in fact, I actually think it makes it easier. Now, what I'm about to describe is way more complicated than it is easy. But in terms of conceptually how we think about it, it does make it easier. It makes it more well-defined. Uh, you know, this is what we had for security in a monolith back in the day, right? We could, we could tell some things they couldn't call things, but it was useless because you could just override them anyways, right? This was our idea of, you know, I can't call a function from somewhere else. And yes, there were other things you could do too, but this is kind of what we did. That was a mess, by the way. Um, you know, when we have a service architecture, that means we can kind of draw our relationships as they truly are, as they exist. Oh, there's a thing over here. It, it contains this kind of data. Uh, these people should be able to rely on it or depend on it, right? Um, but we have so much more to consider when it comes to security. Uh, and the main point I want to talk about is trust. How do we trust another service? Um, it wouldn't be a talk if I didn't Wikipedia something and provide a definition. But that top definition here, right? The reliance on the integrity, strength, ability, surety, et cetera, of a person or thing, or the confidence we have in that thing. I really want to dive into this. I think this is incredibly important, because we tend to miss the idea of trust. First of all, trust is not authentication. These are not, you, know, you don't get trust by authenticating. Trust is more about, you know, identity, right? It speaks to identity. Uh, I, I am this person, I've given you identification, and, and you know I'm me. There's nothing about whether or not I trust you. It just knows that, oh, I, I'm, okay, you're you, great. We can, we can keep moving, right? It does not address trust. So simply authenticating against a service does not give us the notion of trust. Now, we think to the blockchain, right? Because that's how we should think. Cool, right? The blockchain is a tool, just like anything else. There's a bunch of tools. There's people who buy, who buy some great tools here that can help us with trust. I'm going to answer the question now so at the end somebody says, hey, can you apply the blockchain to this? Probably, but it, it doesn't matter. You're missing the point. The point is that trust is way more than a tool. Um, a few things get out of the way on this. This is no longer okay. Simply setting up a service and having something else call it with no authentication, no trust, no anything, isn't how we get this right. It's convenient, but it's not the way we solve our problem. Right? Trust is also multivalent. Right? Trust, the notion of trust should be fluid. Trust is not something that exists permanently in a single state forever. Um, in real life, right? if, you were, if I were to meet you um, and you tell me your name, should I implicitly trust you with all my information now and forever? Would that ever, would that ever just be something to change at some point? You probably would, right? Um, you know, I don't know. Well, let's see. Our systems should never do this. How many of us do this right now? I mean, you, you get a token, a JSON web token or an API token or something, and as long as you have that, I will give you everything I know all the time. Who does this? This is where you all raise your hands, by the way. Um, 
We shouldn't be thinking of trust that way, right? Trust is momentary. It depends on context. And most importantly, trust has to be able to change. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about classification of data and service models and assurance in a little bit, but we need to build the, the levels of trust up as well. Um, I want to think about the following thing, right? There's a couple bunch of questions we can ask. You know, when was this thing that called me, when did it have a penetration test last? Uh, does it have any vulnerable dependencies? If it's in a container, is that container base image vulnerable to anything? Does it have any known unmitigated findings that are still open? Uh, is it behaving differently? Is it calling new services or has it never called me before? Uh, there's a bunch of things we can ask about the environment and, and the, 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 uh, the system as a whole that we can use to determine whether or not we want to trust this thing. Right? We want to create layers of trust based on the information that we have available to us. Um, but the problem here is it requires a much more comprehensive security program. You're thinking, oh, if I have to know the data of the last penetration test, I should probably do penetration tests, right? The answer is yes, you should. Um, and all the other things that go around with it, that's how we build a world-class information security program, right? The, no the ideas that I'm going to give to you now are built on the foundations that you've already done all the things you need to for a solid security program. This is step two or three or four. It builds on all the good things you're already doing. So if you're not there, you need to, you need to take some time and get there. But of course, what do we do with it, right? Um, if you, you know, if you think about kind of how you know somebody, right? Uh, if you know somebody deeply, if you just met somebody, uh, you, may you may choose how you share information, right? If we just met for the first time and you asked something deeply personal, I've, I might not trust that information to you, right? Um, would you answer that if somebody said, oh, hey, um, glad to meet you. Can I have your social security number? You might think twice before you gave them that information. Maybe you wouldn't because it doesn't matter anymore. But what about somebody you've known your whole life? What about a partner or a spouse, a family member? You'd probably give them that information. They might need it for something relevant, right? It might be useful for them to have that. They may need it for life insurance or some kind of application for something that's important. Um, so depending on how deeply or how personal you know somebody, you, you may change or what you know about a person, right? Their behavior may exhibit different um, you know, ideas of trust. What if that person started asking really strange questions, right? What if you know somebody and all of a sudden one day the world kind of shifts a bit? And they're like, hey man, uh, can you tell me what you were doing last Thursday at 2 p.m.? Like, that's a strange question. Why would you want to know that, right? Um, our notion of trust, our notion of, of suspicious, uh, notion of difference, you know, we might, a spidey sense might trigger, you might just choose a different path. Um, would, you know, would you alter your notion of trust in that situation? Most of us would, right? If something weird happened, we might think twice before we gave more information away. On the other side, uh, maybe we trusted somebody with some information and they went and told a whole bunch of other people. And we had established that, you know, this is between you and us. Or the thing I hear all the time, especially at uh, tech conferences, friend DA, right? Friend DA, I'm going to give you some information I shouldn't, basically. Uh, but I'm going to trust you with it. Um, if they went and told everybody, you probably wouldn't friend DA them ever again. Or you may, it may be a while before you did that, right? Again, that's that fluid notion of trust. They did something to change how much you trust them. Uh, also, we don't always trust the information that we're given, right, to make a choice. So somebody may say, oh, yeah, I'm so-and-so, nice to meet you. They may not be that person. Or they might give you a piece of information, and you might not be able to trust that information. You might want to know whether or not they're being truthful when they tell you that information. So it's not just how much you can present or, or, or a caller or a caller relationship can present. It's what could change about how, the type of information they get back. Is it true? Is it false? Is it reliable? And so trust, again, has, it takes on another dimension because we're trying to figure out whether or not it's, it's actual, it's, it's real information. It's, it's, it's something I can use and it's, it's valuable. Um, but I want to pull it back into technology. That's what we're here to talk about today, right? Um, we can shift to the idea of momentary trust. Um, there are lots of things we can do to get there. Um, we can ask questions like, who performed the authentication? So if I have a token that has a whole bunch of information, I can say, well, yeah, well, who told me, who, who gave me that authentication? Did I authenticate the token? Did somebody else authenticate? Maybe I issued a JWT, or there was some kind of Kerberos auth, or some single sign-on through SAML, or there's some, uh, some, some identity provider that provided trust. Something in the chain that I could say, oh, yeah, I trust that person, and they trusted you, so there's a, maybe a transitive trust, right? Um, you can ask who performed the authentication. 
Um, and then, of course, do they agree, right? So you get a token and they say, oh, I'm this person. You can ask the third party and say, oh, is that really them? Are you sure about that? Right, you can do additional verification. What else do we know about you? I asked a few different questions a minute ago. What else do we know about you? Um, <clears throat> based on what we know, to what degree can we actually trust you? Right? Again, I've added dimensions here. Are you who you say you are? Um, can I trust that you are who you say you are? And based on what I know, how much can I trust you? What, what can I give you that I'm gonna feel comfortable giving you? Right? That last depth, uh, that last layer of dimension, is something we fail at pretty miserably uh, in when we design services. Consider the following randomly generated JSON, right? If I were to get this blob with uh, a service call, or maybe I have this and I cache it, right, for performance reasons, that I give a whole bunch of information like that last penetration date and open findings and where the repository is at and the, the dependency file so I can analyze it myself and figure out whether they have vulnerable dependencies or things I can do to reach out and generate new ideas or new information that might lead me to trust or not trust you based on what I see, right? And the other thing is, who do you depend on? If we're talking about service registries, which we will in detail pretty soon, you know, if you don't depend on me, why are you calling me, right? If I, if I have your dependency list and you give me a call and ask for information and, and you don't depend on me, why, why should I give you an answer, right? If, if, I, if I shouldn't trust you because I don't have to, why would I just grant you access or why would I grant you information? Um, that speaks a little more to authorization, but it's still a, a point that we need to think about. And this, this step here, this classification, this is really interesting. Uh, I'm gonna go into that uh, in a whole bunch of detail in a minute. But what, what's the sensitivity of the data? Um, you know, is it regulated information like medical records? Or is it just you know, public information like a website address? Um, we have to consider you know, who are you and, and how sensitive is the data that's supposed to be passing through you. Right? This information can and will change. It's supposed to change. In fact, if it doesn't change, you probably don't want to trust them anymore because that means they're not maturing or evolving or maintaining. Um, you, know, you use this to determine how, how they meet your criteria for delivering your information. You kind of build up a, hey, here's what you need to give me in order for me to give you back something meaningful. Right? I actually think we should consider publishing this as part of our definitions of services. So I'm a service, I have credit card data. In order to receive the credit card data in the raw, you must have the following met. Right? You must have a penetration test recent, most recently within, within a year. You must have TLS enabled. Basically, here are the PCI guidelines. You must, I must be able to assure that you meet the PCI guidelines for me to then hand you cardholder data. Because what I'm doing then is setting up an audit trail and assurance that when I hand the data over, I'm being responsible about it. Now, that is interesting because we think about that between businesses. Right? Oh yeah, I would never give you the cardholder data unless we, we have a legal agreement and it's some kind of trust established that uh, you won't you know, screw me in the end but we don't do that with our services internally. So we don't end up knowing where our data goes. Because right? people just ask for it, we just hand it out. As long as you can connect to it and authenticate against it, you can probably get the data out, right? Um, publishing these requirements also helps you prevent unintended interruptions. So if you take this all the way through and you decide, oh, I'm gonna just not respond to people because they don't meet my requirements, and then you don't publish the requirements and you just stop talking, it's kind of a bad thing, right? That's, that, that causes some, uh, some things you probably don't want. Maybe some unintended chaos. At this point, you're thinking that's really cool, but you're completely insane. Uh, because why would we do this? Why would we stop talking? Why would we, why would we cause intentional disruption or interruption to service just because somebody didn't meet their requirements? Because I should be able to make an excuse and not do this thing and get an exception and just kind of keep going, because it's really important for my business to keep going and taking that revenue, right? Super, super important. Um, yeah, true. In a culture where, you, where that's what's going on, you know, good point. Um, this is not just a technology change. As with all technology changes, it's a cultural change as well. If we're choosing to do this, we're choosing to double down and be more diligent and put more real, actual effort into this. So it's gonna be a cultural change too, right? Because when you stop talking and something goes down and they say, oh yeah, well they went down, and you go, no, you failed to meet your obligations. So we stop giving you data to protect the company. It's a different stance, right? You're pushing it back on them for not doing, not meeting their criteria. Right. I'm not here to convince you to improve your security. It's not, not what I'm here for, right? I wanna talk about ideas and interesting, fun stuff. Um, I'll read about you in the news someday. That's totally fine with me. I don't need to sell you on this idea. I, I, don't, I, I don't want to. But I also don't want you to be thinking about this as a security exercise. 
So I've said this in the name of security, but it's really a design exercise. What I'm talking about here and what I'm going to talk about next is all about how we design our environment, our system. What this really is, the architecture. Because what you do when you have this notion of trust, what you do when you have this metadata about what people have done and their activities and, and their, you know, how much you can rely on them and what they're labeled as and all this stuff that falls out of this, right? This becomes a whole bunch of really, informa really useful information to design things and test things. Um, and this is where we dive into classification of services. This is one of the things that we can do once we've built up this notion of trust. I picked this because I think it has a pretty interesting impact. Um, there's a lot more we can do here, but we only have an hour, so I don't want to go forever here. But the question here is what types of data pass through a service? If I were to have you draw a diagram, how many of you could quickly point out what types of data pass through a service? I want to say types, things like is it public information? Is it cardholder data? Is it medical records? Is it personal information? Is it confidential company information? Financial records? What have you? How many of you could confidently say, oh yeah, this goes here, this goes here, this goes here, this service has this? How many of us can do that? A couple shaky hands, right? Why can't we do that? Didn't we design and build these things? Aren't we the designers and architects of our system? Yes? Shouldn't we know that? Yeah, of course. Um, it's our responsibility, right? It's not somebody else's responsibility to figure out what kind of data we put in our systems, right? We, we, we built this stuff. There's no excuse not to know. Right? Uh, in general, when I say classification, I want to think of a service as the most sensitive data that passes through it, right? I'm not talking about storage or persistence. Simply access, right? If a service has access to data and it's somehow breached, we're going to be able to get that information out. The attacker would get that information out. So we need to treat it as, oh, if it has access to it, somebody could exfiltrate that data, could take it out. Right, so how do we record these classifications? Where do we put them? Um, service registry is a pretty good idea. How many of you are working with a registry right now? A lot of you probably are. If you're in a container environment, microservice environment, you have some orchestration somehow. Kubernetes itself has services, right? It's not, not quite what we think of as a full-blown registry. But it is something we can use as a registry. And actually, I'm going to show you some demos that are based on that in a minute. So if we think of Kubernetes, we can just add a label. It's metadata, right? It's, 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 it's just fungible data. But we can say, oh, the classification, and just put a string in there, right? Um, that's enough to mark a service and then have other services ask, what, it, what kind of classification does this service have? So this is, this is the lower end idea, right? This is one of those oh, I can tack on and, and, and move on. Uh, you probably want something a little more robust, but this can kind of piece through an entire thoughts, right? Um, we can plug this idea into any registry. We can make it hard data, we can type it, we can do whatever we want to make it work. Um, but what do we do with it? Um, the idea here is we want to restrict, restrict the flow of data based on classification. So my example is if the cardholder data environment is classified as PCI, so it's going to hold credit card data. Um, and I'm, I'm a profile service, so I'm going to give you information about a user. So somebody's logged in and they say, oh, I want to go to my account and check what's there. Uh, give me the data about that person. You're going, to you're going to ask all the services for all the information and say, hey, PCI environment, please give me the credit card number for that person. And it's going to go, okay, great. What, kind of, what classification of service are you? Uh, oh, you're PII. Great, cool. So I can give you uh, maybe the address and the zip code and the things I know about the, the cardholder environment, and I'll give you a bunch of stars in the last four digits because I'm allowed to give you that. That's, that's, that's part of my, my, my window. So should the cardholder data service return PCI scope data to that PII caller? Yes or no? No, of course not, right? There's no reason for that. We don't want to display that on a page. That would be irresponsible. But if we could connect to that PCI environment and ask questions, uh, most of us in this room would have a service that would respond with the cardholder data. Right? We're not restricting it. So, it should only pass what it's allowed to based on that classification, right? But the trick here, and I think the most important part, is we use a single interface. We don't make a bunch of random interfaces saying, oh, give me the PII version of classification, or give me, you have a bunch of URLs that don't make sense. It's one interface. Everybody calls the same interface and gets back data based on who they are and what level of trust we have, right? It means filtering those responses based on that classification. So quick demo here. By demo, I mean I typed it in already. 
because we don't want things to go wrong, like cutting off the screen. Um, let's try this. Cool. Um, or not. So what I have here is a service call. It's unauthenticated. It calls a service. And it's a front end service. It's return me some data about a user. The first call I make is going to return me a username, an email, a first and last name. Simple profile data. I'm going to change the classification in my Kubernetes service definition to private from public. I'm going to, I'm going to deploy that definition. And I'm going to try again. I'm going to make a call. And that call then returns a whole bunch more information, like the hash password and the ID. Uh, if I had information like social security number or, or other personal information, I may have more that would go. Um, I didn't change the code. Nothing else happened. I didn't redeploy the code. I didn't modify the code. I didn't add endpoints. Nothing changed at all. The only thing that changed was in the service, the definition, the classification changed. That was it. Um, you know, this would be maybe I want to authenticate somebody. I want to log somebody in. I would need that has password hash to compare against. So we think back to what just happened there. A small bit of Go code. Again, example code, right? If I got a classification and I got a full user, I may just do something silly like make a switch, right? You could probably find a better abstraction for this and a better way to program this, but this is the simplest thing that works. Um, if they're public, I'm going to build a certain object and return it. If they're private, I'm going to build a certain object and return it. Based on the classification, I'm going to dispatch based on what I'm allowed to give. I'm going to define that. I could make stronger assertions, like a contract, and make certain tests around it and, con and, and definitions. Uh, you can go as far with this as you want to. But the idea is one interface, but based on what I know about you and what your classification is, I will return different responses. So you're probably asking the really obvious question right now. How do we know the classification of the caller? So if somebody calls me, how do I know that they're you know, classified to do this or that? I haven't said anything about that yet, right? So Kubernetes has a, a Go client. So reason my examples are in Go, because it was easy to write. Um, and it would get me the service classification from Kubernetes by just asking, right? I can get a configuration. Uh, I can ask the default namespace, because that's all I had uh, for the classification, and return that label, that custom label that I added. Now, please forgive the fact that this, you know, Namespace couldn't exist, or you couldn't find the service, or the classification didn't exist, and nil would get returned. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff that doesn't make this fit on a slide. But uh, the idea here is I can ask the system, right? I can ask somebody else what the classification is. Sub this out for etcd, sub it out for console, sub it out for zookeeper, sub it out for whatever you want, right? Whatever your system of record is of choice, a database, doesn't matter. Um, the most important thing is I ask somebody else who you are. And you think, great, but how do I know the classification of the caller? All I did was show you how to look it up. So we need to think a little bit more creatively about how we know who that caller is. So this is where the trust comes into play, right? Identity is great. We talked about identity. That's authentication. But um, we want to know a little bit more about trust. Because if I say, if I just say, oh, I'm that, that service, please give me the data, I can't implicitly trust that they really are who they say they are. So, Without some level of authentication, it's difficult because we want to know at least kind of who you think you are and kind of be some, some, some notion of a way to validate, right? Or potentially impossible because IP addresses are useless in a kind of cattle versus pets environment. IP addresses, you, you can't tie anything to an IP address. It will just change, right? So you have to have a little more intimate information, right? You could use a JSON web token. Um, example might be uh, a pair like this where you have an issuer that's, that's the third party you can ask to verify whether or not this was you know, interesting or whether you trust that service. So that's that transitive trust. Um, there's the, the typical things about um, you know, expiration and, and timestamps. And there's a public claim here, the service, the front end. right? That's what happens when that service authenticates and gets a token to call other services, and it's returned a claim, that public claim being the service name. If you trust the third party, the issuing service, the token provider, to give, to provide a token that does create, to identify the service properly, you have a transitive trust and you can say, okay, I know that person truly is the front end service. And I can look them up and see the classification from there. It's one idea, right? Um, so we have that public claim. 
we can pass the token of the caller to a service that looks it up. So a small function that was looked up in the database, given an API token, uh, what's the application name associated with that API token? That's brittle, right? That's brittle for a lot of reasons. One, because you have to maintain a mapping. And really, the notion of that token should rotate constantly. And my idea of tokens really are the container, the instance of the container, or the instance of the service itself should have a unique token. So you might have 20 of app running, and all 20 of those apps that are running should have their own unique token. Shouldn't be a token that you provide to all your apps at once. Um, because then you don't know which container or which application did what. Um, you want to know, you want to have individual isolation or individual authentication. Just because something exists doesn't mean it should have a token implicitly. And once you have identified that classification, then that's how you produce that appropriate response. So you want to make sure you log everything about how you produce this. You want an audit trail. Um, this is kind of cool, because once you have a good log of this, it gives you kind of details about how you arrived at the conclusion. So the calls, who called who and what did you decide? Um, what kind of data did you return? So, so when you did re the return of data, what was the classification of the data you returned? And what you get is a guarantee. So somebody said, prove to me that data that was in the car hold data environment didn't leave to another environment that wasn't allowed to have it. It's a hard question to answer. You actually don't have any proof of that. You could actually replay an audit log and say, oh yeah, well here's, here's all the proof, here's what happened. Right? Now you may have made a mistake, doesn't mean you, didn't, you weren't mistake free, but you have a record of what happened. And you could even put alarms, alerts, metrics, whatever you want on that, and start paging people when the wrong thing happens. You can create a set of assumptions that you want to hold true or properties of a system, and when those properties stop being true, somebody will be notified so you can go clean it up. So what we're talking about is creating incident response immediately. Or, even more important, if some other server starts being able to get data that it shouldn't get, we could break the system. We could imp instrument some chaos engineering here and go, you know what, off. We're gonna have to fix it. We don't want any more data to leak. So why, why is this important? Some of you don't have to deal with this, right? Uh, but if you don't understand the flow of data, how do you protect against an attack? Serious question. If you don't know where data goes, how it comes in, how it goes out, who has it, how do you protect against an attack? What controls do you apply? How many of you comply, apply controls because controls? And you were told to? So can you raise your hand, right? Well, a lot of us are told to do this. That's how we're supposed to do. But why? Right? If we have more of a definition of how data flows, we can design more complete controls and more appropriate controls, right? If you don't understand the flow of data, how do you know how bad a breach was and where it went? This is a really interesting question. How many times do you see a breach report? Oh yeah, this company had 10 million users affected. And a month later, oh no, it was 100 million. About six months later, actually it was more like a billion. And they keep changing their mind because the forensics keeps pointing to more, more information somewhere else. And the short answer is they had no idea. But enough digging, enough research finally discovered there was maybe links to other things. But they didn't know for months and months and months. And that data was abused or more often. Or maybe somebody said, you know what? You think you had 10 million users, but if you pay me, me $100,000, I'll give you all a billion and let you know what happened, right? They get ransomed, basically. Um, determine the depth of a breach is really difficult. But when you know where data flows and where it goes to, you know if a system was touched by an attacker they probably had that data. You can see who called what at what period of time and isolate from that transaction log who got the data. It's very quick for forensics, right? Once you have that accurate log, you can produce some in pretty interesting data flow models. So, uh, you know, Adrian has uh, several times in his talks showed about, you know, I have services and, it, and my notion of services draws me a big picture of the universe. It's really useful, right? I, it, with this, with these logs, we can do the same exact thing and draw caller caller relationships and trust and classification and we can replay. At this point in time, this kind of data was floating between these two people. And at this point, it changed. At this timestamp, we started changing the way we, we flowed data and, and what we trusted about the other person. And then it went back. All that gives you that ability to create assertions again. When that data changes, maybe it should always be public and never be anything but public. And when it changes, I want to have the pager go off, right? So we can create assertions on the data that we, we want to always be true. Right. It might look something like this. And again, an example. A timestamp, a caller, so the front end service called the user service. 
we determined at that point in time the caller's classification was public, and we determined that the response classification, the data we returned, was going to be a public classification. And the source of our method for determining it was a JWT token. So that source is important too. What did we, how did we arrive at the trust that that service was who they said they were, right? We, it could be a JWT in one case. It could be an API token in another case. It could be a SAML assertion in another place. It could be a bunch of them, right? We don't want to fit this into one model. Our systems are giants, right? We buy companies, we merge with other things, and we decide one day that, you know, this thing sucks and we want to move here, and so we're going to use a different technology. Uh, our systems are fluid, and so we can have multiple sources of trust here, but we want to have a certain restricted category of things we trust. We want to log that. Because at the same time, if we ever find out that JWT service was compromised, we know that a notion of trust for all those records over that period of time is broken. Right? We can no longer trust anything that happened by that service over this period of time during a breach. So again, we're giving ourselves forensics. We're giving ourselves the ability to go back and look and explore and kind of say, oh, at this point in time, I can no longer trust the service for this period. That's incredibly important when we're thinking about how to retract, how to respond, how to do forensics. Again, really, really important to track that data. What's really cool about this as well is it lets us build accurate threat models. How many of you do threat modeling today? Or have ever tried it? How many of you enjoyed the exercise of doing threat modeling? One person. So, oh no, sorry, two people. I see two hands. This can be enjoyable, I promise you, right? You probably got a really dogmatic, I must use this model and follow these, these 20 rigorous methods. Um, you know, threat modeling is what you make it, but it's also really hard work. The reason most of us don't enjoy it is it's a ton of d digging and legwork and other things to produce a, a valid model. But if we can reproduce a drawing based on our audit logs, we can actually start a pretty reasonable threat model and say, oh, show me all the things where cardholder data or medical records flow. Because that's probably what I care about. The things that return public data, whatever, doesn't matter as much. What I want to do is create a scenario, an attack scenario of all the systems that touch medical records, right? And it could just, here, here's your picture. Here's who talks to who, and here's the, data they, the, the kind of data they pass to each other, right? And instant picture. And then you're talking about the threat model. You're not worried about making the drawings and figuring out who talks to who and doing all that legwork. That legwork sucks. But if we build a system, if we design a system in a way that it writes out those records, we don't have to ask anymore. We don't have to dig anymore. And we know we're right because we designed it the right way. This is why I say this is a design exercise, not a security exercise. Security falls out, but it's truly about design, right? And, you know, the other bonus is auditors. How many of you here have to deal with auditors on a regular basis? Fair amount of people. When they turn up, you've got to have good answers. When they turn up, it's usually a lot of work to get those answers, right? Because you're going to have to dig for a while. What if you can just push a button and go, here, have fun, right? I got, I got work to do. That's how you really should be able to respond to an audit. Here, I got work to do. Here's some data. Go dig through it. Ask questions when you, when you have them. Right? That's the greatest way to make uh, you know, a confident stance, but also not have to interrupt yourself. Right? This stuff shouldn't be an interrupt-driven process. It should just be, oh, I've got my stuff together. It's automated. It's recorded. Let's keep going. Right? I've talked about a couple of ideas, and there's a whole lot of work to do. So if you're thinking, wow, Aaron, that may have been interesting, or maybe it wasn't. Uh, I don't do any of this. Um, what should I go do? Short answer is don't panic. It's OK. Um, I don't expect anybody to be doing this right now. Uh, maybe a few of us here are. These are the kind of things that companies like Google, Facebook, Amazon, some of the larger companies with a lot of pockets, a lot of really intelligent you know, researchers in this area are doing and, and, but really more exploring than doing, right? They're doing it, but they're, they're, they're treading the path, right? This, these are newer concepts. Um, so the idea or the takeaway from this talk is not go out and do all this stuff tomorrow. You're not going to find a bunch of papers on this and a bunch of instructions and a framework and a toolkit to do this. Um, you're going to have to sling it together. So start in pieces. Start small. Start by drawing a picture, right? Just draw a simple picture and see what you see. If you can't answer questions on that picture, then you start thinking, how could I automate this? How could I classify things? If you're using a registry, take all the services in the registry and just give them a label. Even if you don't know, just say, I don't know, right? Just unknown is the classification of that service. Fine. You can go figure it out later. 
what you can then do is say, hey, tell me all the services that I don't know anything about. And you can send a list out and say, hey, who can help me with this? Please update your definitions. Or maybe you could have a build that runs every night. It says, hey, service registry, tell me all the services that don't have classification or have a classification of unknown. And then the service owners get a notification, a blast every night that says, hey, we ran the build. We don't know anything about your service. We're going to stop talking to you pretty soon if you don't update. So you're going to give people notifications saying, hey, you need to fix this. I need more information about you. I expect something new to happen. Right? Start small with that. Start small and just start to build a picture of your world. Once you have that, then ask questions and produce automated drawings. OK, hey, here's all my services, and here's kind of what the data they, they hold, or the data that passes through them. You have a better picture, a new picture, right? Evolve this. Don't try to boil the ocean. It doesn't matter, right? Um, and for some of you, it may not, even, may not even be important, right? Maybe you're not protecting anything useful or valuable, right? Maybe you're a static website. In that case, don't do any of this. That's a really bad idea. Um, if you have data worth protecting, this is worth doing. If you don't have data that somebody wants to steal, or they can be sued over, or shut down over, or lose your job over, that's OK, right? Um, this, is, this is the kind of things you do when it's important. Invest wisely in security. Um, so be careful. Don't go back and say, hey, I need to do this for all our, all our sites right away. And uh, you know, it's a, it's a couple of blogs with the, you know, some kind of just public information on them. Right? Do it if you have medical data, or you have personal information. You know, the users of your service trust you with that data. It's really important to remember that it's not just about protecting and keeping your job. You know, thousands, tens of thousands, millions of people, hundreds of millions of people may be trusting you with their personal information. But when that goes out, it, it hurts, right? It hurts people. And that's important, right? We are responsible for that, right? Not somebody else. We are responsible for that. If we make those bugs, if we, if we make those mistakes, that's on us. Right? For a long time, we kind of said, eh, you know, it's somebody else's job to figure that out. No, we made this stuff. Right? We built this. It is on us. Right? A lot of these materials have, a lot of these things have yet to materialize, like I said. There's not going to be like a how to or, or, a, or a, a stack overflow page that's going to tell you how to do all this stuff. It's complicated because security is complicated. How many of you uh, watched the lunchtime keynote? Right? There were some interesting takeaways in there. This is, this, this, is, this is kind of, this is the idea, right? Some things are going to be complicated, right? Make sure you don't make them needlessly complicated, but this stuff can be complicated, right? Don't expect it to just fall out and be easy. Now, some of you may have done a greenfield project, the small design, and it was really simple, and you just knock this stuff out tomorrow. Awesome. Most of us have some pretty old systems and a bunch of pain to deal with to get here. So, uh, you know, you're, again, there's no, not going to be a how-to here, right? But if we want to start taking security seriously, this type of discipline is how we have to kind of, this is what we should be shooting for, right? I say discipline because that's what this is. Um, this whole thing is about being disciplined enough to write things down, to produce some drawings, to ask some questions, um, to, to gain a better understanding of our environment. I was talking to Joe Armstrong just before this, this presentation, and he, he, he said something that was interesting to me is, uh, you know, my job is to understand things. Like, oh, interesting job. Uh, but then it resonated a little bit more. Somebody has to understand how everything works, right? And as we make these giant systems, it may not be one of us. It may be 10 of us or 20 of us. But all of us should be able to ask and get the information we want. And building systems that tell us about how they work or how they're laid out or what happens when we ask, you know, when we do certain things, that helps us understand things. Because it may not be the job of, of a one person to understand things, but it's all of our jobs to help all of our, our fellow employees understand what we're doing and why. Right? If we do this right, more than just security falls out of this. Right? Doing this right benefits everybody. It benefits architecture because we have a better view of the world. We can draw better pictures. We can see more of what's going on. Operations. If we do this, we can see dependencies. Right? Who, go, who has what? Who goes where? If I go down, who's impacted? Right? The whole impact graph falls out of this. You think about this as just a good design exercise, all the really good bits of having a service architecture designed well kind of fall out too. Right? Again, good design. So a couple parting thoughts before I take some questions. Um, there are a couple of things I blew past here. Mostly, how do you secure the thing that establishes your trust? Right? It's a turtle's thing. Right? I didn't say anything about that. 
this is, go this is another hard problem. How do I know that that JWT issuer wasn't compromised? Or how do I know the service registry wasn't written to in a way that was you know, malicious, allowing data to flow to a new thing? Uh, the short answer is you don't. At some point, you have to say, you know what, I'm going to have the trust to a certain point. Look, I'm going to monitor the heck out of this thing. I'm going to have a whole bunch of alerts. If a service registry gets written to, I better know about it. right? I want to know every time somebody writes that registry, tell me what changed. Give me a log of that, and I want to review it. I want to have assertions of what it looks like. I want to run a build every single night and a test that would fail. Say, oh, I think these service services are classified like this, and when they're not, I want somebody to get paged. Right? There needs to be actions that happen. Right? You can't secure it all the way. The controls will always fail. A single control or a set of controls are bound to fail. So we build additional controls that tell us when those controls fail. Right? It's not enough to make a control. It has to be a control on a control that tells you when the control fails. It sounds complicated, but it's not too bad. It's all about monitoring and logging. There's a dozen people on this board who probably can tell you about logging and monitoring. Right? Um, you just create some queries and some alerts. That's all it is. Uh, but it is important to think about that system because the system is fragile. It's designed to be mutated. And so when it changes, make sure your assumptions change with it. And if they don't, you take real action against it. You can't be lazy on this one. Because again, at some point, your trust is predicated on everything that goes through it. So you have to be able to establish a good chain of trust. With that, I'll take some questions. Yes. So there was a whole lot of um, buzzword uh, and, and uh, things there. Uh, the question that I, that, that I heard was about protocols, right? N new protocols. Um, they're tools. Uh, I trust them as far as I can throw them, to be honest. Um, you know, newer protocols are excellent, but I tend not to go too far down those paths unless I'm really sure about them. What I'd rather do is use a protocol that I'm more familiar with, that I can monitor, audit, log, and kind of create a, a more formal assur assurance on, than a newer protocol that may not be able to be poked and probed and, and, and tested the same way. So for me, I value more of observability than I do of a, a, of a better control. Right? Because like I said, most controls fail. And I want to know when it fails. But if I can't observe it, I don't know when it fails, it's silent for me. So I put more, more weight into the system of controls than I do in like a single protocol or a single control. That's how I design things in general. Again, it's, it's, uh, it's fault tolerance, back to you know, how, how Joe thinks, right? It's about how do you, when these things fail, when I have faults, how do I know about them? How do I recover from them? How do I become aware of them? I, te I tend to design things that way over like, you know, a single new protocol that came out. That make sense? And isolation, um, same idea, right? It's another control. Isolation is excellent. I think you should isolate things. Uh, that being said, isolation creates problems, creates complexity. A lot of us want to move faster, right? So in terms of uh, design, this is a different design. We're choosing a different path. This says, oh, hey, we're open. We can all talk to each other. Uh, I'm not going to do network isolation. I'm going to do classification of systems, and I'm only going to send the data that I want to the right people. Right? It's a different kind of control or set of controls. So you can do isolation. And in fact, in some cases, you, you might be required to for regulatory purposes. But I'm, what I'm saying is those, those designs, those, those isolations, they break. Right? I'd rather have something a little bit more robust on top of that, that that lets me kind of give additional guarantees that I didn't give anything out that I shouldn't have. Make sense? Other questions? I have some on the app. I hear Adam. Oh, there's, there's, <laughs> I, heard, I heard a voice. Uh, feel free to keep them coming. We're going to probably do about two or three more. But um, can you describe the difference between classification and authorization? Yes, the difference between classification and authorization. Um, so authorization is. Um, am I allowed to do this thing? Uh, if, could, can I ask you to give me this data? Um, so I'm asserting that I'm allowed to, and you're going to give it back to me. Um, classification is identifying what types of information I can return to you. So it's not can you ask me or not. It's when you ask me, what, what am I going to give you back? So there's a subtle difference there, but what's important is you're always allowed to ask but I might give you a different response based on who you are. So authorization is yes or no, it's binary, right? Authorization says, oh, given this, can I have a response? And you say, no, you're not authorized. But given a classification, I might be able to give you a little bit of data or a lot of bit of data, depending on who you are. 
that make sense? I don't know who asked it, but uh, I want to make sure I answered the question. What prevents a compromised low trust service from capturing a token from a high trust service, which calls the low trust service, uh, and impersonating it? Yeah, what, pre what prevents impersonation? So um, this is going to be more about the design of trust. So along with the token, the token, is, the token shouldn't be considered a single point of trust. We need more information, right? Um, and this goes to the design of the system like I talked about earlier in my parting thoughts. Um, you need additional ways to verify the caller, right? If I grab a JSON web token and present it to you and you say, great, um, that's a level of trust, right? It's a, it's a, it's a low rent service or a low classification service. Um, what's interesting about this, if, if I have a really sensitive environment, I may say, oh, the issuer is JWT. Um, I might say, you know, that's not good enough. That issue is not strong enough. I need you to go back and give me another proof that that's useful. And then if I give them back another claim that says, oh, I have several issuers. Here are the issues that verified me. Now I can assume the level of trust that's required to complete this request. So we want to stagger or build depth to the issuers of trust. Because some trust is going to be transient and simple and doesn't matter. It could be cheap, right? And that's why I kind of shy away from that whole blockchain thing, right? Because it's expensive to compute things in some cases. But you know what? Maybe that is what I want to do later. Right? Maybe that will give me my, my second version of trust because only this, only this node could have computed this answer that would give me that level of trust, a new issuer. Right? So we build depth to that to get what we want. OK, um, two more. Yep. One, uh, how can we implement this type of security without decreasing the performance of our system? How do we implement this without decreasing performance? Great question. I have two answers. One is high performance systems tend to not have these kind of things in them. If you have super high performance, you want more isolation, right? This design does not work for everything, right? This is more of a high assurance environment than a high performance environment. High performance, like the lunchtime keynote, tends to lead to fragility and sacrifice, right? If you need that sacrifice, that's totally fine. This may not be the right choice. That being said, you can do a lot of very aggressive caching, right? It's not that every single request has to verify all these things all the time, right? It may be a single request is good for eight hours, or is good for an hour, or is good until something else tells me it's not, right? Revocation of trust can be issued, just like anything else, right? So I can assume that for now, until you shut down or, or, re, or, or bring yourself back up again, I trust you. That could be a notion as well. So again, aggressive caching helps us get through that performance lock. All right, last question. Do you have any recommendations on how services should behave when the system of trust fails? One more time. Do you have any recommendations on how services should behave when the system of trust fails? Ah, so how should the system behave when the, when the system of trust fails? Um, they should keep going, right? Um, when, you have, when the system of trust fails, the applications probably aren't going to know the system of trust failed. They're going to rely on the system of trust. Right? What we need to be doing is having monitoring and alerting that tells us when a system of trust is broken so that we can inject you know, some kind of incident response. Um, a, a good attack on a trust system is not going to be noticed by the things that rely on it. Right? It, it won't be noticeable. It's not observable. But if we have other uh, observation that's on top of that that tells us when it happens, we can push the button and say, revoke all trust. Right? We're going to wait until somebody says revoke that trust. So we need to design another layer on top of that control where we can revoke the trust and there's a big red button that says revoke all trust, right? When that happens, then we can kind of reset. And that's us signaling that the trust has been broken. Thank you. Can sure. we do one more round of applause for Aaron? Thanks. <laughs>